Hey everybody, Mike Henson here for ALS News Now. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to another Neuron Trial uh, interview. Uh, what you're going to see tonight is, uh, or here, is testimony from a wonderful lady named Dawn Bouchel. Um, Dawn is joining us via phone uh, because uh, she didn't have a computer uh, that was set up or ready yet. Uh, for doing a video chat. So some people prefer to do phone and that's fine. Um, there is a slight bit of, um, of echo on my voice and that's, it's not bad. I just want to warn you that this was the first time I'd done a, a speakerphone um, interview. So um, other than that, uh, the interview is highly compelling. Uh, Dawn is an extremely credible uh, interview. Uh, and very, very intelligent woman. I think you'll just, you will be thrilled at this, uh, to, to hear what she has to say. Let me just put it that way. Uh, her words are again, very compelling, highly credible, and she's a, a very articulate person. And I just don't see how people can continue to discredit, uh, people like Dawn as they go through this trial process. Um, I do not edit my uh, interviews for content. I might remove a stutter or something, um, a glitch, but what you're going to hear are her words, unscripted and in, in complete form. So please join me now as we listen to Don Bouchelle talk about her experience in the Neuron Phase 3 trial. I'd like, like to, to say hi to Don. How are you today, Don? I'm doing well, thanks. Awesome. So why don't you start by telling us a little bit about uh, when you were uh, diagnosed and um, a little bit about your progression and where you are in that process, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, I was diagnosed in uh, mid-2017. Uh, my symptoms began in about November of uh, 2016. I started, uh, my foot started slapping on the ground. Um, I went to the doctor and he, you know, I was very fortunate. My doctor is, you know, he's been my doctor for almost 30 years. He's, he knows me well. He, you know, he sent me for, you know, some x-rays in my back and he said, you know, maybe it's a herniated disc or something like that. Um, and I had previous problems with my back, so I didn't think anything of that. He sent me to physical therapy and about two months later, I called him back and I said, doc, this isn't working. It's getting worse. It's not getting better. So he called me into the office and he, you know, gave me another exam, sent me down for an MRI and said, you know, you know, we could take the regular course for a herniated disc, but I don't think that's what's going on. He says, I'm going to send you right down to barrels. I think there's more going on here than meets the eye. So, you know, him knowing me and knowing my history well enough and also being, you know, uh, being very astute, you know, he, he spotted something was not right and sent me right down to barrels, which being in Phoenix, I'm very fortunate. I've got the best medical care possible here. Barrows and the Mayo. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I went down to a neurologist down there. He ran a whole series of MRIs, did a very thorough exam, and said, No, it's not your back. I'm sending you to this guy, who happened to be um, Dr. Stephen Kumar, who was an ALS specialist. Um, Heard that name? Yep, mm -hmm. certainly. Yeah. He actually was the. Um, he started the ALS clinic at Barrows uh, and was the, uh, the the chief of that for about 10 years running and then broke off to do his own um, at North Phoenix Radio uh, Radiological and, and did, um, you know, started his own ALS clinic and based that around research. So he, he's got his own lab. He, he does a lot of research, tries to, you know, use the latest and greatest technologies and, and drugs trials and things like that. Now, he diagnosed me, but I didn't, I wasn't real confident with his exam. So I wanted a second opinion. Of okay. So you got a second opinion. Um, I went to the mail for that. Okay. And um, had a very, very thorough exam there, a thorough EMG. Um, and that they did confirm that it was ALS. Now, um, my grandmother had died of ALS when I was about 14. And I had thought, you know, I, I had no idea it was hereditary at that point, you know, or that certain kinds were. Um, but, you know, I, I just, I had it in the back of my head all this time going through and thinking, okay, well, you know, maybe that could be it, but I doubt it. You know, it's such a rare thing. And um, when I got my diagnosis, I asked her about, you know, the hereditary nature of ALS. And she said, you know, 
they just realized, you know, with the Ice Bucket Challenge, the research that they did through that, they were able to confirm that certain variants of ALS were hereditary. Um, so they did a genetic test on me and found out that I'm a C9 or 72, um, and that is familial. Okay. Um, and it turned out my father had frontal temporal dementia. Oh. They thought it, they thought it was not complicated, but then he had trouble speaking and swallowing, and they thought, well, that's not right. Um, so it turned out he also had ALS, mm-hmm. um, represented as frontal temporal. Well, they didn't know this until after they diagnosed me and started looking further into him, right? Right, right. So, yeah, this was a whirlwind for me. I was like, okay, this runs in my family. You know, this has not skipped a generation. So now this means my kids have a greater than 50-50 shot sure. of getting that. So, okay. you know, I, I, I'm i the kind of person that, you know, I try to keep a positive attitude. Of course. You know, I've, I've fought for things my whole life. I'm not going to stop now, Right. So I decided, all right, am I going to sit down and take this? Am I going to just, you know, go home and get my affairs in order and wait to die? Or am I going to get busy living? So I decided to get busy living. And I took up, you know, I got on my soapbox about ALS. And I went to the advocacy conference in D.C. uh, last year. Okay, good. Uh, You know, I I got involved with them and Neil's... uh, uh, research ambassador um, here locally. I'm active with the local ALS association, and um, while the you know the federal uh, at the national level they've had a lot of failings, um, our Arizona chapter is quite exceptional. Yeah. Um, they've been quite helpful towards to me and the community. They do a lot of things that a lot of chapters don't do. So, yeah. And for the record, we want to be clear that you know our issues that surround the ALS Association are primarily uh, at the national level. We, we realize yeah. there are many local uh, chapters that are doing great work, um, including our Oklahoma chapter here. Our, our beef is, is yeah. only with the research strategy per se and the, the apparent lack of, not with the actual people on the ground, the boots on the ground. Uh, you know, as you know, right. you've seen many, many good people in ALS uh, and those that care for us. And we want to, you know, we've been clear since day one that our problem is is strictly with the research portion of this like neuron you know as you know uh don today uh you know neuron has still not received a single dime of of money from either the ice bucket or uh the als association which is pretty tragic and that's that's why we're here today to talk about not so much about that uh but about the actual results of the trial for you and so why don't you why don't you tell us a little bit about uh your experience um with the trial and uh okay so i tell you okay so again don we're not you know here to talk too much today about the uh about the you know the the politics of als but rather focus right. strictly on the neuron trial which i'm sure uh you know many of us are interested in and a lot of our listeners are interested in as well um full disclosure i am also enrolled in the trial i've been for phase i've been for my first visit but I haven't been past that yet. So I always have to give that disclaimer. Why don't you tell us now, start down that road. You you said you went to the Mayo. Uh, is that where you learned about Neuron? Or tell us where you first uh, where you first saw uh, and heard of Neuron, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, so, in, in, you know, after my diagnosis, I had that big decision to make, right? How, how am I going to approach my journey with this? Absolutely. And one of the one of the things I was thinking of, you know, mine is familial. I've got future generations to think about. I've, you know, ingrained myself in the community. I see other people that are affected. And I've made good friends with some of these people. Um, and it breaks my heart to see what they're going through. Um, so how can I benefit the community was to get involved with research. I started, um, I, I'm the kind of person that does my own homework, right? I right. don't rely on the doctors, my Medicare, med- medical professionals to dictate to me what my care is going to be. <laughs> Seems to be so, a lot of us in ALS that are like that, by the way. <laughs> so good for you. <laughs> yeah. So I, I you know, started doing some research and I found out about clinicaltrials.org or .gov. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Anyways, uh, so I, I went on there and I put in a keyword search, ALS, and, and then there were like 170 different hits that came up. Okay. And I thought, well, how am I going to choose one? So I figured 
I should probably narrow down my choices and say, okay, which, what, what kind of science do I believe in the most? I don't think a pill is going to is going to solve this. It's a genetic disease. It Absolutely. resides as you know in as a mutation in one of over twenty some genes, right? Absolutely. Um, so how do you attack this at at the base level? You, you know, if you're going to find a cure, if you're going to find an effective treatment, it's going to be on that genetic level. Right. So I started looking into gene therapies or stem cell therapies. Yep. And I narrowed it down to that, and that's how I came across you know, brainstorm and their neuron treatment. Um, I did a lot of research into the company and I, I thought, you know, this sounds really promising. Um, so I, I applied and went through the evaluation that I got in. I was one of the lucky ones. Mm -hmm. I was within that window of my two years of symptom onset. My breathing was still very, very strong. Mm -hmm. Um, my progression was fast enough that they could track it. Right. Which, as you know, being a participant, that was a big issue. You know, you have three visits, and they track your your progression over those three visits. That's if right. If you don't have noticeable progression, you can't be included in, in, in the study. That's right. Explain, uh, explain so, a little bit about how, when you say track the progression for those that don't know, who may, be, who may have ALS that are sitting at home, what, you know, they do the ALS FRS score, and then they do a blood draw, which of course, as you know, there's really no biomarker per se yet for uh, ALS. Um, but what, explain how they, how did they track your progression from visit one to three? Because those are the first three crucial visits, right? So. Right, right. Well, and they did that. You know, they called, you know, now I went to California for my visit. Okay. Um, they're not conducting the study in Arizona, but I'm fortunate enough that I'm about five hours away from, you know, drive yes. from where the study was being conducted in California at UC Irvine. Um, now, you know, they, they did a phone interview first. Uh, then they called me in for my first appointment. They did a thorough examination. They did the ALS FRS right. score um, and took all my vitals, things like that. They said, looks good so far. Come back in another month. We'll do it again. So next month, I, I went back in. They did another uh, exam, you know, thorough. They did the ALS FRS, FRS. They noticed that there was some progression. I had I had degraded like one and a half points between visits. Um, okay. Went back for a third time, same thing. About okay. the same rate of progression. I lost about one and a half points between those times. So at that point, they accepted me into the study fully and scheduled my bone marrow aspiration. So okay. they do this initial bone marrow aspiration. That's, most stem cell therapies are not done with your own stem cells. This one is different in the fact that it take, they take your bone marrow, they separate it, they run it through this process that separates out the mesenchymal stem cells. Sorry. They take those stem cells and they send them off to another facility that processes them and combines them with this drug or treats them with this drug that matures them and pre-programs them. Um, and then they re-inject them into you every other month over a six-month period. So you get three treatments. Now, um, I went through the treatment, you know, my first treatment. Didn't think anything of it, you know. Went back for my subsequent lumbar puncture a month later. Um, they did the, you know, the scoring again. They, you know, it didn't look like I had progressed that much. Okay. And I didn't really put two and two together at that point because it was still kind of early on. Um, went back for my second and then subsequently my third treatment. Um, I did notice a trend over that time that my progression had slowed to almost zero during the time I was receiving those treatments. I maybe dropped a half a point between beginning and end. So it really did slow my progression. Now, I had seen other folks that, and made friends with other folks that were going through the trial about the same time I was. Sure. Unfortunately, one we know got the placebo. She passed uh, before the first study even completed. Um, mm -hmm. Another one actually took his first steps in months after his first treatment wow. so you know he but he did eventually pass so we don't know if he actually got the real thing sure. and it just didn't take for him or or if he 
was getting the placebo and this was placebo effect. They got him to walk. It's hard to tell, right? Right, right of and course. And they won't disclose that till the end of the study. So um, they did, you know, they've never told me that I got the real thing, but I am a firm believer that I did. Um, it literally bought me about six to eight months more of my life. It bought me six to eight months on my feet that I would not have had had I not gotten those treatments. So you genuinely, um, you genuinely believe that. I want to be clear that you, that you don't, you know, you're, you obviously sound highly intelligent and you don't believe and you know your own body. So you don't believe yeah. that it was a placebo effect anyway, because in the trial they said that that had mostly disappeared. Uh, I believe it was after yeah. 14 weeks. So um, Absolutely. are you, can you say with confidence that you believe that you felt better? You felt actually, you know, clinically felt better. Um, I wouldn't say better, but I didn't get worse. Okay. All so, right. yeah, I didn't see any improvement. Good clarification. But I did see a slowdown in progression. Okay. And I did notice that after about my second trip, and I was like, you know, I walked into that first appointment with the cane. Mm -hmm. I walked out of my second treatment with a cane. Right. Um, you know, I my third treatment, I, you know, a cane again. <laughs> Right. You know, I was still, you know, I wasn't progressing so That's much. Incredible. And and it was fantastic. You know, I was yeah. really grateful that I, you know, did get to do that. I, I, I do have to say, it's a daunting treatment. It's not an easy treatment. That's what um, I've heard. You're getting yeah. a lumbar puncture every time you go in once a month, which in itself is, is not a pleasant experience. Mm -hmm. And yeah, now have you had your first lumbar puncture? No, I haven't. I've had one in my life. It was for a previous doctor, uh, Dr. Appel, actually in Houston. Mm -hmm. And uh, thankfully, uh, <laughs> it went well. Actually, it was it was nothing. But we are doing this and hope to do this and be successful for our own uh, selfish, obviously, reasons. But there's also another point to this, and that is to get this trial done so that we can get it approved by the FDA. That's the big thing. Exactly. And some of us have been blessed uh, and are fortunate enough to be able to do these trips. You know, it's 14 trips for me. It's to Boston. And so the goal here, yeah. though, is FDA approval. I mean, that's where yeah. we're going. And we believe that the FDA uh, should at this point, um, through people like you and people who've had these experiences, be able to tell, frankly, if this yeah. is something that's going to make it or not. Um, the problem is the company cannot stop the trial and ask for an IA because if they do and somebody at the FDA says, well, I think Don Bouchel's lying, um, they lose their entire trial because yeah. all they can do is judge this based on clinical results, meaning right. there is no definite biomarker. Now, I will say this, um, you know, uh, Brainstorm believes they've identified one called Caspase 3, which is a clinical mm -hmm. biomarker, as you may know, that seems to reduce or fall in people by up to 60% in in the trial. So they believe that uh, they, they have actually called this caspase 3 the executioner module molecule or the death molecule. Uh, so perhaps, as we initially thought, the neuron uh, doesn't actually regrow anything. It simply breaks the feedback cycle of inflammation. This trial is trying. It's taxing. It's not easy. Um, and yeah. you have verified that for, for folks. And again, the goal being uh, FDA approval, and that's that's the goal. But uh, oh yeah, yeah. Sorry to go off on that little side thing there, but go, continue, please. No, that's okay. Um, and and to to reiterate, it's not easy. A bone marrow transplant, you know, they drilled into my hips seven times to get enough bone marrow to do this mm. for six months. Ouch. Um, <laughs> that you know, the, for a couple of days after that, it felt like I got kicked in the back by a mule. You know, wow. it was it was pretty slow. Um, the lumbar punctures, of course, are not pleasant. Uh, the last one I had caused a severe spinal fluid leak. Mm. Um, I ended up in Barrows for five days. Now, there are risks to this. Sure. Um, of course. It is a daunting procedure. Would I do it again? Absolutely. You would. would. I continue you would. doing those treatments? I would. Absolutely. If they could buy me, you know, for a couple of days of discomfort every other month. Um, wow. You know, I, I would make that trade off to live longer, to walk longer, to function longer, to be with my family longer. You know, I was lucky enough to see my daughter get married. Am I going to live to see grandchildren? Probably not. 
Um, well, let's not go there like, yet. Let, let's not. Let's well, not. No, let's no, not no, go I, there yet. <laughs> realistic. Realistically, you know, I I know that I won't benefit if this does get approved from the FDA because I don't think I'll be around long enough for that. So, um, you know, based on my progression, you know, and my grandmother's history, I'm following hers exact exactly. Right. Um, we were diagnosed at the same age, same onset, same progression. So, um, you know, based on that information, I'm making a judgment call on how long I'm going to last. Right. Right. Um, you're a real. So you're a realist. I understand. You got to be realistic yeah. about it. Yeah. Well, and I'm. I'm. I've got. I've got a, a science degree as well. So, you know, I'm. I'm very logically minded, and I. I do. You know, categorize things, and you know, I. Like I said, I'm a researcher. I go out and do my homework. I, you know, I learn as much about things as I can. I can tell. Um, now, with that being said, you know, there's there's a lot that I don't understand about this treatment, but I do understand what, you know, the procedure is, what they go through, the cost that's involved, right? Um, the personal sacrifice that's involved. And it is, it's huge. You know, like, like I said, you're taking your health into your own hands by doing this. Um, you are sure. saying it's okay. And I accept these risks that these things, you know, spinal fluid leak may happen. A severe headache, you know, from a, a lumbar puncture may happen. You know, um, they're puncturing your spinal cord. There's all kinds of risks associated with that from infection paralysis. So, you know, you, you take those those risks and you kind of stew them around and say, "What's it worth to me?" Now, my motivation, like I said, was not just for me. I knew that you know the study was going to go on long after I was done. I know that by the time it goes through FDA approval, it's going to be too late for me and probably a lot of the people I know that are pals. Um, however, what we're doing is we're securing this this treatment, this very very promising treatment for future generations. For you know the next set of pals that get diagnosed, for our children that have that you know that carry that you know C9 or 72 or SOD1 you know marker, um, and they did say that it, it they anticipated it would work best for the familials. Oh really? Oh, could you expand on so, that? I haven't heard that that they think that it could actually be better for SOD. Yeah, yeah. Um, for C9 or 72. I'm um, sorry. Okay. And then, yeah, and they believe that, you know, the familial, you know, ALS patients have a better chance with that. Wow. So, um, you know, I think that it's going to affect everybody differently. You know, someone may, you know, be able to be, um, you know, lift their arms or walk a little longer or take their first steps. Some may see some improvement. Initially, some may just see a slowing of progression. Sure. Um, and I think it's going to, you know, just like ALS, it's going to affect everyone differently. But I think this is, you know, a very, very promising treatment. I think that, you know, based on the results from phase two and now the results that we're hearing from phase three, I think this is going to go on to approval. My concerns are financially, how's this going to happen? Um, insurance companies are not going to want to cover it because of the cost involved. Um, let's face it, it's a half a million dollars for six, six months worth of treatments. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that's not just for the drug and that's not overpricing the drug. What that is, is it's hospital costs. It's, you know, you've got medical, you know, different backgrounds of medical, medical professionals working with you. Um, you've got, you know, different doctors, different nurses. Um, you know, full staff of, of, you know, coordinators and people from the company. You've got multiple, you know, facilities that do different parts. You know, the bone marrow aspiration is one, you know, one facility that does that, um, or it takes care of separating up mesocarmal stem cells. You've got another, you know, place that it gets sent off to, to get those stem cells, you know, processed with the neuron. Um, you've got, a lot of intrinsic costs that are built into this. The private so jet, for example, that you fly, that you're actually, so you can say you've flown on a private jet now. That's pretty cool. I mean, not technically, yeah. but your stem cells have. And to, to the point there, what you're saying is, is the, 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 the indirect costs are massive. You know what I mean? To dosing this drug. And we, we understand that, um, you know, now we know that competition 
drives price down and also um, efficiency. So to do this for a hundred people, because a hundred are getting placebo, as you know, um, yeah. you know the costs, like you said, are immense. Uh, they literally people yeah. they literally fly yourselves across the country. Um, uh, yeah. on a private jet, you know, and that, that stuff's not cheap. Some of that they probably yeah. do get donated, but a lot of it they don't. So, so the anticipated cost of, like she was saying, you know, I think it's, you know, half a million could be, could be reasonable. They, they say, well, 300 is, is closer, but she's probably honestly more correct because of the indirect yeah. costs involved. Um, now when we start, when this is FDA approved and we start to do, uh, you know, 20,000 a year, uh, it yeah. the, the likelihood is that it will probably fall by a magnitude of of you know uh, well exponentially probably I mean I would imagine yeah. um, consider that Medicare is on, Medicare straight Medicare is an eighty twenty plan yeah right yeah so they cover eighty percent of the cost at a reduced rate right so the hospital tax more onto that anyways yes so your the cost to the PAL is going to be exorbitant because. Yeah. 20% of a million dollars a year. Right. Yeah. yeah that's it's, a, a big chunk of change. It's still, it's still really a matter of, you know, how broke is broke, I guess you could say. You, you've you yeah, got 80-20 yeah. insurance. Um, you're going to need some sort of supplemental, obviously, policy. And these are all issues that will have to be addressed. Um, and we're not here to say yeah. that it's all wine and roses because it's not. But, the, but, but it all starts with FDA approval. Once that process happens then uh, all of this other stuff uh, be, can fall into place. For example, Don, as you know, uh, you know, there are the, the other drug that recently uh, was approved, Radicava, as you know, uh, yeah. many, many, many people are quoting prices on that upwards of 150,000 a year. Now, um, yeah. you know, as, and many people are, are getting that uh, paid for completely. Uh, and some of that is a partial subsidization by a company called Searchlight. As you know, uh, so many people are getting Radicava for no, no expense. However, the problem is this: is that for for a drug that's already close to 150 grand a year, um, it's not producing any results. I mean, I say that no. uh, it's not spectacular by any means, especially for that cost. Now, is it producing anything? Uh, maybe. I mean, doctors seem to feel better about prescribing it earlier on in the in the process of ALS. But one thing we do know is that there are no Matt Bellinas from Edervone or for, for Radicut, yeah. Radicava, anything you want to call it. Radicava has not produced anybody yet who has actually seen an improvement in their physical yeah. condition. I mean, and that's what I think a lot of people are failing to understand. We already have an FDA approved ALS drug that is not producing results. So, um, you know, that's one critical thing to keep in mind, I guess, with prices. Well, and it's all relative. On that note, I'd like to also note that I've known several pals, their insurance will cover it for about six months, and then their insurance is denying it after that. Bingo. And so, you know, there's issues with that as well. And we probably know why now, don't we? It's just because it's not producing any significant results. Now, if you start giving people neuron and people start, you know, having ex an extra 10, 5, 10, 12 years on it, uh, yeah. The insurance companies will have to pay for it because at that yeah. point it is officially a life-saving, you know, procedure. And I think that's yeah. the other thing that people are losing sight of is the insurance companies are not dummies here. They know and they're watching these things. They're watching people continue to die uh, almost yeah. unabated with, uh, you know, on Radicava. And it's, you know, they're, they're not stupid. They know they know what they're doing here, guys. That Yes, they it may take them a little while to catch on, but... You put you put some people out there like yourself who are having actual reactions and, and seeing life extension from uh, and dramatic life extension, not three months like we're seeing from, you know, uh, from Rilazol, but a dramatic life extension extension. The case for them to not pay for this is going to become pretty doggone difficult. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. OK. Yeah. OK. So. Um, Go ahead and now tell us a little bit about, um, you, so you've ended the trial now at this point, right? And yeah. you, you kind of came out of the three, uh, of the three dosings, let's say the three injections, feeling approximately the same physically as when you went in. You did not improve, but you, you, is your characterization of it that you stabilized, you'd stopped progressing for three months? Is that kind of, or for how long? Tell us a little bit about your actual benefit. Yeah. 
Now, you know, after my first treatment, I noticed it slowed down. Um, and, yeah, by the end of the trial, I had I had only lost maybe a half a point. So wow. there was very little progression over, you know, a six-month period. Um, now, with that, you know, about two months after I stopped receiving the treatments, I noticed my progression started to back up. Sure. Uh, I started having problems with my right leg. I started having problems opening water bottles with my left hand. Um, you know, little things starting. And then the progression has, you know, gone back to that, you know, one and a half in three months. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, so that means that, you know, if we get this treatment approved, it's going to be something you're going to have to do for the rest of your life. Yes, um, that is true, and and or uh, if we get the other two approved, we can take this to a multidisciplinary approach, and that's the other thing we want people to know is that you know neuron has been uh, has been good so far, but we also have two more uh, bullets in the gun, so to speak, that are close. One of those being yeah. Doctor Pell's procedure, and as you know, uh, he has said that he has completely halted the progression of ALS for a one year period. Now we've had the pleasure of speaking to Mrs. Bradley, Larry Bradley's wife, and she was actually in Washington, D.C. with us, and, and we got to all hear firsthand about that. Uh, and, and it's a shame that that procedure uh, has not been uh, treated like the, the uh, in the manner that a statement of that caliber from a man of that caliber would dictate. Um, you know, Dr. Appel is widely regarded as the greatest ALS doctor in history, uh, yet when he makes a statement over two years ago that I stopped the progression of ALS and nothing is, nothing is done. Uh, you know, a lot of us have a problem with that. Um, and so, so that, that's the second. And of course the third is the copper ATSM, uh, drug, which I don't know if you've heard of that yet, but that one has shown to slow down the progression of ALS by as much as 70%. So wow. I think you might agree, Don, that if we had all three of these things right now, and if, the, if, if people would actually commit to solving this this disease, you know, you are living proof that it can be done. One of the things that's interesting about your uh, about your situation is that, you know, you had familial ALS, and apparently this drug actually worked for you with familial. So I'm not sure why we are focusing on so much of the genetic component right now. I understand that for later uh, in research, but the bottom line is that we shouldn't be worrying about why so much as how we stop it. How do we stop the progression of ALS and buy that extra runway? And I think that's what you may be saying is that, uh, and I've heard you say that, that it's all about extra time for you, right? So right. you want to buy extra time uh, by using this procedure and by using it. Is that, is that a fair assessment? And is that how you see this drug fitting in for now? Yes, absolutely. And I do want to make one one distinction for you. You said genetic. Um, I want to get away from using that that phrase genetic because it's not genetic, it's hereditary. Okay. It is a genetic disease for everybody, sporadic and familial, because it resides as a mutation in a gene. Hmm. However, hereditary takes on a different that he has passed on. I okay. just wanted to clear up that distinction sure. for everyone. You say genetic, being hereditary. Are you saying that you believe that, uh, like Dr. Appel does, that everybody's ALS is genetically, you know, it, as he puts it, ALS is what, or uh, excuse me, genetics is what loads the gun and the environment is what fires it. Do you, do you believe that theory? No, I'm a little bit on the fence about that. I think okay. that, you know, either you're born with, I know I was born with mutation because I'm, I'm, Familial. Yes, okay. of course. But even sporadic. Um, could it be possible? Do we know enough about um, about the gene structure to know that a mutation can occur, occur later in life? Right. So, you know, there's that possibility. Do we know that that's not possible? I don't think we do. So, yeah, it could be a, a mutation that happens later in life. It could be something you're born with and is triggered later. A lot of a lot of uh, scientists do theorize that you're born with those key indicators, you know, certain cancers, ALS, MS, any you know, any of those markers that are going to trigger something within you, and then you just got to find what that trigger is. You would counter that at some point during your life, um, you know, that that understood like, pulling the trigger that pulls the trigger. Okay, so um, you know, do I know that? 
it happens one way or another. I can't say that. I'm not a geneticist. However, you know, my theory is that, yeah, I think you're born with those markers. Uh, I think you're born with that, you know, you have a marker in a gene somewhere that says you could have ALS. Um, and then you come across a trigger, whether it's chemical or physical or, you know, any kind of manifestation right. of that. And then that's what, you know, sets it off. Um, I think that's a very good possibility. And I think the only way to test that is that theory is to start testing infants. Ah, okay. Um, that's interesting. You I, know, I'm I do agree with you. See what they're born with. See what they're you born know? with. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And to, and to test them at point A and then maybe point B when they develop ALS, is that kind of what you're saying, and see if there's been any mutations? Now, that would obviously be a, a very long-term study, but it would certainly, it could be definitive, you know, to do something yeah. like that. Um, and, yeah. I, and I agree with you. I think that there must be some sort of genetic component to this because not everybody that's exposed to the same things develops ALS, nor uh, are people that are not exposed to these things. They they continue that they continue to develop ALS. So also there's there's the fact that in a familial situation, my father had three brothers. Okay. None of them mm. came down with ALS. Just him. Mm -hmm. um, I have two children. They could carry the marker and not ever become symptomatic. Mm -hmm. So we know that to be true. We know that you know within a family. You know, the ALS, we know how the ALS genes pass down through the generations. Yes. Um, but we don't know which of those siblings are actually going to become symptomatic. And they, they warn a lot of familials about this, getting that genetic testing done for their children. Because, you know, you don't want, want it in the back of someone's head that they're automatically going to become symptomatic if they're not. That's right. Um, you know, you don't, I don't want my daughter or my son walking around with this weight on their shoulders going, oh, God, this is going to happen to me someday. Wow. Well, it may not. So, you know, they've opted, my children are adults now, they've opted not to get the genetic testing. And okay. I respect that for that purpose. Sure. And that, that's, that that's what I was going to ask you. Um, a lot of people don't understand this. Can you imagine the weight of having that, you know, on your shoulders to have to talk about that with your with your kids if you're you know, uh, if you're, if you're familial, because, uh, and, and that was a personal question. I, and I appreciate you sharing that. I was going to ask you if, if they had been, uh, if they had been tested yet, or if you had planned on getting them tested, you know, that's a, that's a huge, uh, dilemma in our world, you know, is what, what do we do? Do you, do you want to know or not? <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, that's tough. Exactly. You know? And I left it up to them. I didn't make that decision for my children. They were adults. Okay. Um, they, they do know what, what the odds are, um, and both of them, we sat down and had a really good discussion about it. They chose not to because of that fact. You know, I may find out I have this, and I'm going to be living that with that knowledge all my life, yeah. and I may never become symptomatic. Yeah, that's true. But, you um, know, I don't want my daughter to have a breakdown when she's 53 going, oh, that's when my mom was diagnosed, that's when my grandmother was diagnosed. It's incredible, isn't it? That's one of the things that this disease... It does. It forces some of the worst decisions on people. And really what people don't understand is unlike in cancer where you have a chance, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to pull out of this. I mean, every decision you make with ALS really is modulating it, uh, bad versus worse. None, no decision yeah. you make is is good. And that, that kind of goes back to, you know, going back to the neuron trial now, you know, that's kind of even how the neuron trial is, um, frankly, as hopeful as we are about that. Uh, you know, it, it is expensive uh, to, 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 to make these trips. And that's why it's been difficult to find even 200 people with ALS yeah. to, to fit into this. And the, and the FDA, uh, maybe you have some thoughts on this. I mean, you know, well, the, just that, the, the inclusion, um, the inclusion criteria is yes. so strict. They yes. have to have it that way to get an accurate test, right? You can't compare apples to oranges and get a, get a good result. You have mm -hmm. to compare apples to apples. So you have to make sure that everyone progresses at the same rate. You have to make sure that they're within that first two years of, you know, die of, of symptom onset. Right. You have to make sure that their breathing's above 60 some percent. You have to, you know what I mean? They, yes. they try to put, put everybody in one bucket. Well, when you've got 20,000 people to, to choose from that have ALS, 
how many of those are within that two-year window? Some people don't even get diagnosed until sure. three or four years in. Sure. You know, they go through batteries of test after test after test. Is it, what's wrong with me? You know? Absolutely. And, and, you know, and then finally, three years later, they determine it's ALS. Well, now it's too late. And this is where, uh, you know, you and I may disagree. I don't know. I'm not, I don't know. But uh, you being a, sci- a scientific minded person, um, and I, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I, I was a, a business person and, and uh, a financial planner. And so I'm not uh, a science, science expert, but what I do, what I feel and what I do know is that ALS um, is different. It should be treated differently than uh, than diabetes, for example. And one of the things where we may go off the rails, I'm not sure, but, you know, um, and I think it speaks to the honesty of these interviews, uh, but I believe that ALS uh, should be prioritized in a manner by the FDA to reflect its its severe nature. In other words, you know, we are literally designing trials for ALS uh, that uh, are very similar in nature to non-destructive uh, diseases, you know, chronic illnesses like diabetes. And, you know, that I believe that's one of the primary reasons that we haven't really made any progress in ALS, frankly, whereas in cancer, you know, the, they don't allow placebo trials in oncology much anymore or even at all because, uh, you know, it's considered to be a terminal illness in some cases. And yet ALS is the mother well, of all a, terminal it, illnesses. But there has to be, uh, see, for the FDA, you either have to rely, you know, compare it to historical data or to a placebo, one right. or the other. So you ha- you would have to have a substantial amount of historical data to support, you know, a point of comparison right. to the, the study participants. Okay, so, um, you know, we did the same thing in computer testing, right? You have a certain set of criteria that you test against. Um, that evens the playing um, treating it though, you know, as, you know, not having a placebo, you know, you can't compare it to something that's not there. With cancer, we know certain types of cancers. We know how they progress. We know how they react to these medications. Mm-hmm. They, you know, different medications work differently. Different treatments work differently for different, different sure. types of cancer. Um, with ALS, we can't say that. Right. Um, Every one case is different. Nobody's exactly the same. Or they say that. Anyways, um, I'm sure some of us are. I know I am with my grandmother. But um, for the most part, everybody's story is their own. Yeah. Well, so, certainly nobody progresses you know, with the exact same pattern. We we do know that. You yeah. know, the progression patterns are different in people. Um, I guess my I guess my point was is that... So, there are no, there are no being, clinical... Uh, there, there are only clinical endpoints with ALS. There are no data like there are like tumor size like there are in cancer so you have a lot more information in the cancer fight and to design those trials you know is PSA falling with prostate cancer yes or no um is tumor size shrinking with this particular type of chemo yes or no but with ALS all you have is frankly observation Uh, you don't have a a biomarker yet and that's sad but I wonder Will we ever have it? And not only that, how much longer are we going to continue to wait uh, to design trials that that have urgency? You know, and so right. uh, sorry, to, sorry to interject there, but that's well, you know. and, well. And keep in mind, what are the what are the big the big fundraisers in the U.S. Heart disease and cancer. Mm-hmm. Those are the most prevalent forms of illness. Sure, the biggest killers in the United States or in the world, for that matter. Yes, heart disease and cancer. They get a lot of press yeah. because they have a lot of people that have those problems. You've got yes. hundreds of thousands, millions of people with heart disease. You've got, you know, millions of people with cancer, different types of cancer. Um, with ALS, it's 20,000. Yeah. That's a, you totally. know, when you look at a world of how many, what, 11 billion, something like that worldwide. Right. Uh, we're, we're not even a needle in a haystack. That is true. It's a very rare disease still, but it's growing. That's a very rare disease. So it doesn't get the funding. It doesn't get the, you know, it doesn't get the press. You know, it doesn't affect many people. So they don't feel so, you know, empathy. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think that we're, we're on the horizon right now with ALS. And one of the things that's frustrating is it seems that many people who've been involved with ALS for a long time, 
they have an expectation of failure. I think uh, that that's quite frankly uh, was warranted. Uh, there have been 51 failed drug trials, you know, for ALS, uh, not a single Nobel laureate uh, in ALS yeah. yet. And so, so the expectation of failure is there. I think the frustration for many of us like you who have now been through this trial is that, is that we see it differently. We see three, three different procedures or therapies, which have actually shown some results and, it's frustrating that, that those are not being treated with maximum urgency, in our opinion. Um, and you may, you may feel differently again, but we just we believe that uh, this disease needs to finally go away. It needs to just die, and we're, it's within reach, uh, at least Absolutely. to turn it into a treatable chronic illness for now until we figure out, okay, what's the smoking gun? And that may be another 20 years away, frankly. We just don't know, but we do know we're starting to learn how to control progression. And I think that right. that's why you did the trial. That was your hope. You didn't, you knew it wasn't going to cure you. Your goal yeah. to go through all that pain and suffering and cost was to buy time. And, and I, uh -huh. I don't know if you disagree with this statement, but to many of us who are diagnosed early or when we, when we're diagnosed early, stopping progression is a functional cure. It's not technically mm -hmm. a cure, but it does allow yeah. somebody to continue to live their life. What if, what if somebody could live another 25 years, right? Exactly. Uh, and exactly. and so maybe speak a little bit on on what stopping progression meant to you during that time period. It must have been incredibly exciting. Oh, it was it meant the world. Like I said, it let me live to see my daughter get married. Um, you know, it, it it it's allowing you know let let me see the last Avengers movie. <laughs> right. You know, there's right. A, I'm a nerd. Okay, so uh, you know <laughs> there are things that I look for. I I look forward to the next Star Trek movies that are coming out. I may not be around when they get there, but I really want to see it. You know, I want to live for that. I, right. you know, my bucket list is very small. Um, I've been one of those people that, if, you know, if I wanted to do something, I've always done it. Me too, Don. No, I didn't wait. You know, for children. Oh God, we need more money to have children. No, I didn't wait for that. Oh God, we need more money before we got to have this in savings before we can take a trip to Europe. Um, no, I didn't wait for that. You know, I figured if I'm going to wait to be ready, I'll never be ready. That's right. So, you know, do it, you know, so my bucket list is very small. There's, there's, you know, what I want is to spend time with my loved ones, to spend time with people that I care about, you know, my friends, my family, um, the ALS community that I might be able to, to help, right, in some way. And I've always been active in it because, you know, my grandmother, um, I was always, you know, when I was a kid, you know, I'd watch the Jerry Lewis telethon and I'd, you know, yep. hear about these people with muscular dystrophy and, and ALS is part of that group. Um, so, you know, I always donate every year to the, you know, to the telethon for that. I always drop the change in the jar at the store for MPA. I still donate to MPA. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe what we need to do is roll up under that umbrella because that does have the press. That does have, you know, the, the numbers of people backing it. I agree. Um, you know, we are part of a greater collective and we're isolating ourselves just saying ALS as opposed to a form of muscular dystrophy. So, you know, that may be one solution to the problem, right? right? Let's right. get us under, under a bigger envelope that has, they have big dollars in advertising for MPA. Huge. Right. The ALS Association does too, but they don't spend it. Yeah, that's true. And that's, right. I think there's a lot of people that feel exactly like you about that, that maybe, um, you know, maybe we should go, you know, Dr. Appel was an MDA guy for a long, long time. Remember seeing him on the telecast and his little bow tie, you know, um, he's a well-known MDA supporter. And yet uh, it seems as if now we, with, with all of these procedures that we have, it's becoming harder to defend an organization that seems to have that now that they're essentially zero for three, on these, they did fund Dr. Appel, but with an absolutely shameful amount of money. Uh, they they did not fund what you got at all, and then they funded the Copper ATSM with with three hundred grand, which is nothing. So my point is, if we're giving all this money and all this ice bucket money, but it's not going in a in, in a manner that's prioritized to the to the right. best procedures, and, and like you said, you're a logic person. That's what you do. And in in business, we solve problems by identifying the best options and pursuing those yeah. options first. We don't take a bucket of money and throw it in the air to see what sticks, especially not after things have become, have self-identified as being 
very potent or or likely to succeed. And I think that that's yeah. where Neurone is. I do, we, we're not saying it's a cure. Uh, we do believe that it will be FDA approved. Our problem yeah. is simply timing. We need it now. Exactly. Um, we need it now. We, we need, need it yesterday. But yeah, and, and and I think you know, like I said, that you know, with with these drugs, you know, something different will work for different people. But the and and I'm trying to choose my words carefully here. It's okay. <laughs> um, the ALS Association has all this money, but who decides where it goes? They don't have, they're going to need, if they want to disperse some of that money amongst the trials, and let's face it, there are hundreds of trials out there. They couldn't fund all of them. That's right. Maybe say just phase three. Okay, these made it into phase three. We're going to throw some money at them. So what they need is a committee. All right, they need some doctors, some nurses, they need some administrators, they need some pals and cows in that. Yeah, so I think if you have a, a committee that's designed of, you know, that's designed by all these people that have different backgrounds, right, and yep. different perspectives. Um, have them sit down with a list of those phase three trials and go, okay, do you think these are the most promising, and let's throw some money at those. Um, and start doing it that way. Um, right now, they're just, you know, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, basically. They're in, you know, putting out fires mode, um, saying, okay, well, you know, we've got a lobbyist that's approached us about this one. Maybe we should give them some money. Well, that's not the way this needs to work, right? Absolutely. We need to look at the research. We need to look at the data. We need to look at the past, you know, phases and see how promising this is. And if it should go to phase, if it should complete the FDA. And then we need to come up, you know, and I know the ALS Association has also been working with the FDA to try to fast track approval. Um, well, they say. Well, they say they have. Um, we did not. We were not able to confirm that in our meeting. But uh, that would be nice, wouldn't it? You know, go go to the yeah. FDA. Uh, they say they meet with them, but you know. Well, I, I can verify that last year because I was on a couple of calls for that. I was on that committee with Niels. So yeah, okay. um, the AOS Association at last year's um, you know advocacy day, mm -hmm. they had the FDA there that spoke to us, right? And they set up a meeting. Uh, they announced it there at the, you know, at the seminar, um, and then you know, a lot of us were on that call on those calls. There were three or four calls uh, right. that were conference calls with you know the ALS Association, some pals, and the FDA. Sure. Um, talking through these points, how can we you know, how can we improve your process to get our stuff through it faster? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, the FDA lets. Let's face it, under the current administration, does not have backing that they would have had under previous administrations. Um, they're losing money. They're not, you know, they're not operating as efficiently as they could. Um, they've got fewer people doing more jobs. So things are not going to get through the pipe as fast. Right. Um, if you take their, if you apply for their fast track, right, um, to get it to market, you know, get it, get approval within six months, say. Um, sure. The paperwork gets submitted at the end of the trial. It gets hit, you know, maybe three to six months to get reviewed, and then it's released. Um, they haven't really put the effort into it, and I think what you're doing is going to light a fire under their asses. Excuse my language, but you know, to get this going, and I think that's what it's going to take. Yeah, it's going to take a movement of people to say, "Look, we're not happy with how this approval process works." Right when you know, we know that the drugs that get a bunch of money thrown at them by big pharma get approved first. That's exactly right. You hit the nail on the head, and I want you to know we haven't we haven't done a recap video on this yet. But we sat across the table from from also uh, management last or two weeks ago, and to your to your whole thing on strat, uh, prioritization of these therapies and how we would solve problems with a committee and and look at the best therapies. I want you to know, and everybody out there, we 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 brought that up. Uh, we did almost verbatim what Don just said, and the look on their faces was one of complete stupefaction. They had no concept of being able to understand that you should prioritize drugs that seem to show the most promise. I swear to you, yeah. there are people in that room that are going to say that, uh, along with me. We're not making any of this stuff up. Uh, the fact that they are incapable of 
prioritizing these best drugs. You know, for example, Don, oh, Dr. Appel made the statement, uh, you know, about uh, his TREG one per phase one procedure two years ago in, in, uh, in June. So, you know, this month, it's two years. We've known that he stopped progression for two years. Now, yeah. two years is a whole lot of time. Uh, and, yeah, we, and he hasn't even started his phase two yet because of lack of funding. Dr. Appel says over and over, uh, we don't have enough money. Uh, what his, his, he's famous for saying that ALS is not incurable, it's underfunded. And so yep. we have $82 million or whatever it is sitting in the bank at ALSA. And here's a man who's, who, who is literally dancing like a carnival monkey for money. I mean, and he yeah. is the most regarded ALS researcher in the world. And he can't even get the money out of these people. So, so I guess, Don, the question is, is, and I, I totally agree with your FDA stance as well, with the exception of the fact that, you know, they've had five years almost to get these trial guidelines finished. And what we heard yeah. when we sat across the table for them two weeks ago was we're understaffed. Uh, they, they just, for some reason, ALS is not serious to these people. They have, even when we bring people and you, like when you went to advocacy days, even when these people see the suffering of, that these people are going through, they just say, man, I'm glad that's not me, and they move on. Now, we, we are seeing a change. I'll be honest with you. It's a numbers game. It's a numbers yeah. game. Look it at is. the numbers. You have, you know, 2 million people with cancer. You've got 20,000 with ALS. It's true. Big Pharma looks at that, too. When, you know, this is why we don't have... The, the research and the drugs and the things that are going on behind it. There's a yes. select few, maybe 170 worldwide, 140 worldwide that they're that they are currently testing. But there's not hundreds of them because we're not on cancer. We're not going to put billions of dollars in these pharmacy pockets. We're going to cost billions of dollars in insurance. Right. Okay. You look at a company and how it's structured. Okay. And you see that. Marketing gets the biggest budget. Right. Right. Right? Yep. Marketing gets the biggest budget because they're the biggest revenue draw. Exactly. IT gets the least. It's the most expensive, but it gets the least because they don't draw revenue. They're only an expense. They're read on the books Absolutely. all the time. So, you know, that com- you know, when that company does their budget, they get all the marketing because that's what's going to make more money. Well, Big Pharma does that too. They, they go around and look at all these drugs that they've, you know, that they've got on, you know, in their pipeline, and they say, okay, these are the ones we're going to push because we have the biggest revenue generation possibilities on these. Yeah. Okay. So if we can take a pill off the shelf and sell it two million times, we're going to choose that over the one that we can take off the shelf and only sell twenty thousand. Absolutely. That's okay. that's right. Um, so, like you said, you mentioned diabetes. Huge, huge money. So many people are affected. You know, look what's happened to the price of the drugs. They jacked them through the roof. There's no, there's no shortness of supply. They right. just know they can do it because they've got people over a barrel. That's right. Is that going to happen to ALS too? Ugh. If it even, if we ever get anything through approval, because we don't have the money of big pharma behind it, we don't have the insurance companies behind it because it's big for them so, that's right you know you know it not enough patients have it it's not going to be in that same bucket as cancer or heart disease you're right or diabetes so we got to be the squeaky wheel right i, I totally what agree i completely you gotta agree be the that are prodding them in the ribs every time we talk to them and say hey what about us what about us what about us right right and we need some help from them. We need some, we need some regulatory help to, to to realize that ALS is different. It's not, you know, it's not cancer, uh, even. You know, with cancer, you have a chance. They're pulling people with stage four cancer out of the grave right now. I've seen it yeah. personally, and yeah. there is no hope for ALS yet. Um, I would like to ask you one question about all this and what you think about. Uh, this ties in nicely with our last question about about let's let's take Radicava. Uh, Radicava was approved. Uh, you know, with all Japanese data, a very small trial, it was 140 people roughly, in six months by the FDA. How in the heck did that drug get approved? And, you know, uh, and yet Neuron is having to go through these ridiculous phase trials. Um, why do you think Radicava was approved so quickly for ALS, uh, despite having solid data, frankly? I mean, they're, they're, 
there was very little data and the data that was there was I'm not going to use the term cherry picked but you well, know there were and, multiple and they groups didn't use, they didn't use placebos either they used they used historical data absolutely correct and clinical so endpoints right if, if yeah. we take that model take that model yes and apply it to others so let's break it down what did they do they got searchlight involved yep. right yes they were a huge part of bringing this to market they were um the the company that developed radicava is a very large pharma company that's correct so and they were actually researching it i think for alzheimer's were they not it was a stroke drug it had been it was in japan for stroke. about 13 years so, so it had a long right. it had a long development track but it had no yeah. als history none at all yeah, exactly. and and now we see surprise uh the pharma company that backed that or created that drug is now a sponsor uh, or a partner of also so I, I, what my question to you is why are these drugs get why, like Radicava or let's look at the JC drug. You know, they called that JC Fusion. They actually had a name mm -hmm. for it. it. Did every waiver in the book by the FDA uh, to get that yeah. in her body. And then we have drugs like Zolgensma for SMA. You know, you mentioned SMA earlier, I think, uh, for babies, for infants. So, you know, yeah. here's a drug that's improved. How are you going to do, uh, how are you going to ask babies if they feel better? Uh, it's pretty simple. Yeah. They either become unparalyzed or they don't. And so we yeah. had Zolgensma get approved with a, a trial full of 14 babies only, 14. Uh, it was done extremely quickly. Now, people will say, well, that's curative. Well, okay, so it's curative. You know, like we said earlier, stopping ALS early is, by nature, curative. If you don't progress, who cares if you, if you have the, drug, the disease, just like HIV. Uh, people with yep. HIV now are living complete productive lives. So yep. uh, with over, uh, I believe, almost 100 drugs. Um, and so I think that the entire strategy, frankly, is broken with ALS. And we just cannot seem yes. to get any help from the two people we need it most from. Would you care to comment yeah. on, the, on that? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, it's a shame. We need to out with the old in with the new. Okay. We need to get some movers and shakers in there. Some people who are willing to stir the pot. People like you. Well, you know, uh, people like, you know, you, you've got, you know, a bunch of ALS patients out there. You've got a bunch of pals out there who have lost their pals right. um, that are advocating. Let's get them in positions of power, all right, so that they can stir the pot. Agreed. You've got business people running a medical yeah, I could not could not agree more. Well, and pr professional fundraisers and PhDs, more or less, you know, we've got IT guys that are calling themselves director of research and that, you know, our board director of research or whatever. And that, that just really terrifies me. You know, um, mm -hmm. I believe that, frankly, I hate to say this, but the top three neurologists in the world and the top three graduates from Wharton Business School could probably solve ALS in 90 days, at least get it on the right yeah. track. You know what I mean? Um, yep. and I just think it's a shame that people are being used like carrots on sticks, uh, for endless, uh, an endless fundraising, basically scheme that is producing no results and it's never going to produce results. Frankly, if you don't decide that you're going to prioritize Dr. Stanley J. Appel, who has now completely halted the progression of ALS in, in clinical trial, if you can't fund him or even have a press conference, uh, or a fundraising ask for him, then I have no choice but to question the motives of the people who are making these decisions. What are they doing? What are they waiting for? It's well, I want to, I want to say thank you uh, so much for your time. I've taken up way too much of it today and I'm sorry. Uh, you, you, you sound very passionate about what you do. And I know that you, you've experienced what many of us hope to to experience you know you've seen their own in action people have called it false hope people have called it uh you know a sham people have said that you know have defended uh, the comp uh you know people not giving it any money uh any of the ice bucket money and i just think that if we don't fund the drugs that actually show promise then what are we doing in this game what you know and so our goal is now excuse me to move into a phase of proof people have said well, you've only shown one or two people. And I, you know what? I agree with that, Don. I do. Um, but what are they going to do when we show 20? 
you know, I, I want to say thank you um, for doing this. Is there anything you want to, is there any final thought? If you, if you don't have one, that's fine. We've been very complete today and I thank you for that. But if you have something that you'd like to say on the way out, uh, by all means, please do. Well, bravo to you for what you're doing, um, raising awareness, um, getting the F, you know, working with the FDA, working with the ALS Association, trying to get those wheels turning, um, you know, get the, get, get the word out there and, Really try to turn this boat around and, and, you know, let's head for, you know, through their seas, right? Let's get those fun, the fun, let's get Absolutely. Those you know, submitting those drugs. Let's get those, you know, companies, you know, interested in, you know, doing something for the good of a few for once in their lives. I say kudos to you for being willing to speak out. And, you know, I just think that. ALS patients are so vulnerable as it is, and we must begin to protect them. We've got to protect their interests. And if their interests are not being served, then maybe we need to do something else. And like you said, maybe we need to look at joining forces with other groups like MD, MDA, excuse me, and going back to some of these things, whoever's willing to take this on. There are other people who are, are starting to come up now. Uh, Brian Wallach yeah. and, and his, some of what he's done. You know, there, there are options, folks. I mean, we don't have to stick with this forever. Whoever, to me, whoever, is, whoever wants to focus on drugs, that's our group's whole thing. Whoever focuses on the drugs has our support. That's what this is all about. Drugs in bodies, not pies in faces or gimmicks. Well, let, let's consider this, too. You've got a lot of philanthropists out there that are trying to raise money for charities. Absolutely. And will put good money behind charities if they, they deem fit. Look at Melinda Gates. Has anyone approached her about ALS? Has anyone pitched her the story? You're right. And, you know? and, and and most of all, who's best positioned to do those things, right? I mean, a bunch of people who are at home just trying to hang on, who've been financially ruined. No, it's, it's the people who advocate for us. You know, uh, you talked about advertising earlier, and people have actually laughed at, at the notion that we should have advertising in ALS. I mean, as a business person and as somebody who obviously uh, understands things like you do, you know, companies don't advertise for fun. They put money out yeah. expecting a return on investment. And if you were yep. to if you were to tell people that donated to the Ice Bucket Challenge that, hey, uh, you know, Dr. Appel uh, has a procedure right now that could stop ALS. We need your help. Would you please donate $20 million to that cause? I think you'd find that people would be, they, they would not only get $20 million for that, they'd get double that. Once they, oh once they yeah. know that something has been done. This endless yep. fundraising trap is not going to solve the problem, frankly. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank so, yeah. Go ahead. I, I think you're I think you're on the right track with what you're doing. Thank I you. think you know this was a great discussion. Thank you for, you know, oh, man. getting my voice out there. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for doing this. I mean, I really appreciate it. And you know, uh I, I, I do not edit these videos. Your voice and will be heard in its in its uh, full entirety. And you know, you know, I just I want people to know out there that you know that that what we're trying to do here is prove that there are ways to attack this disease right now. Uh, yeah. What you just heard from Dawn is living proof of that. Uh, and I want to say I want to let you go now and say thank you so much. And I'm gonna I'll I'll let you go and then do a, a short close out and maybe uh, you and I can speak later about some other things because you have such a wealth yeah. of knowledge and I want to say thank you very much. And um, thank you. absolutely. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let Don go there and just say, um, guys, we we've got a problem right now uh, in this battle. Um, we have we have three therapies that have begun to show promise for ALS. Now what the question is, where do we go from here? What do we do? You just heard an incredibly intelligent woman tell you why this drug needs to be approved and why it needs to be approved now. Um, we're going to continue to do these videos because the more we do them, the less it becomes possible for people to, uh, frankly, to, to, to say bad things about a procedure that we know works. Um, I realize that people need to see proof, and that's what we're going to do. I also realize that I've seen this proof with my own eyes. When we were in D.C. two weeks ago, I personally witnessed uh, a neuron trial recipient walk all over that town, and had, he has not had a, a treatment in, in almost six months now. It's been five months since his last treatment. Now, in the world of ALS, not progressing in five months is absolutely unheard of. And this is what I'm getting at, folks, is that we're not, we're not being done right with ALS right now. 
there is no strategy in place to get these drugs or help these drugs or to guide these drugs to approval. Okay, there's not. It does not exist. We've seen it firsthand now. We know this. Despite what they say, there's no plan to help these people, these three specific drugs. They say they funded them adequately. They have not. They say they gave everybody what they asked for. They have not. If they did, people like Dr. Appel would not be going on in the media and saying things like, it's not under, it's not incurable, it's underfunded. We need more money. Okay, use your head on this, people. Uh, drugs like Neurone were not given a single dime. You just heard Don explain why. A lot of this is political, okay? I, I just want you to know that there are things that can be done for ALS today. They are not being done. Uh, and we're going to seek to change that. Um, I want to thank Dawn, you know, uh, for doing what she did today. Uh, again, highly intelligent woman. I mean, these are the kind of people that we need speaking out about ALS. These are the kind of folks that we're going to continue to present here. And I want to say thank you for watching. And this battle has not ended. It's only begun. And it's not going to go away. For the people who think that, who are in power, that think this is going to fade, it's not. Trust me, um, we're going to get this done, and we're going to get it done with your help. I ask you, if you have ALS, if you know anybody who has ALS, just open your eyes. That's all we're asking. Stop believing everything you're being told, because 90% of it is not true. Again, our battle is with the national level. I'm sorry that we have to do this. I'm sorry that, that, it, that it has to be this way. It's not personal. Okay, It's just business. But I saw the people... Uh, who spent thousands of dollars to travel to Washington DC two weeks ago. I looked in their eyes and they deeply affected they they deeply affected me. Some of them, uh, a couple of them almost to the point of a of a complete meltdown, frankly. And this disease has to be stopped. And and it can be stopped. If we could just get these barriers out of the way and if we could get the FDA to understand that these drugs, they will help. They're not a cure, but they're going to slow down the process. And that is what we should be doing right now. No more arguments, no more bull crap. Let's get these drugs approved. Let's let people try them. When we do that, we're going to start to make a dent in ALS for the first time in history. Um, and we ask you to, to join our cause at No More Excuses at my Facebook page, which I'll post in the video below. Uh, and we're going to continue this process. Uh, we have more people scheduled. Okay, this is not this is not over. I've got another gentleman scheduled who said he felt like a 19-year-old a kid again. Now, <laughs> that's a big reaction, and I don't expect that that's actually true. But the bottom line is is that I will help filter the noise out. Uh, I will help you to understand uh, what's real and what's fake. Okay, this, that's, our, that's the mission of our group at No More Excuses and Contagious for a Cure. We want you to know what the facts are because you are not being given the whole story. And I'm not saying this is a giant conspiracy theory. But all I'm asking you to do is just open your eyes, have an open mind, and to finally understand that people who disagree in ALS, you know, they have the right to do this. They're not angry. They're not living in different silos or any of these other ridiculous uh, metaphors I've heard uh, for the ALS problem. Look, we just want answers. And there is a new gr a group of people coming into this, uh, into the ALS world, and it will get solved. Okay, uh, the naysayers and, and the people who've been working on this, who have no who have no skin in the game, um, their voices are going to start to fade. Okay, the people who are suffering from this disease and who have the capability to do this, their voices are rising. Okay, and with your help, we will continue to do that. And I want to say thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.